Thank you all for coming. It's a pleasure to see you all here tonight. You probably know who I am, but I'll just tell you in any case. My name is Bob Pazna. I'm a professor of philosophy here and the director of the Center for Western Civilization, Thought, and Policy, which is uh, sponsoring Professor Allen's visit. Uh, he's been here for uh, just about two full days now, going around charming nearly everyone in his path, and I think uh, it's just your turn now. Let me say uh, a little bit about him. His PhD comes from the Claremont Graduate School in political science. He uh, taught for a few decades at Harvey Mudd College in Southern California before moving to Michigan State, where he was professor and also dean of the James Madison College there for, uh, I think, another few decades. He was... Uh, <laughs> he, was, he, was, he was chair of the U.S. Commission on Civil Rights. He's uh, on the board of the Heritage Institution. He has been on the board of the National Council on the Humanities. Uh, he has published a great deal. I won't even mention all of his articles, but uh, among the books that he's written, he's written books on George Washington, on Montesquieu, on Harriet Beecher Stowe, on James Madison, and on the Federalist Papers. Tonight's talk uh, is entitled Conscience, the Basis of Liberty, Character, and Civilization. William Allen. Thank you, Bob. Th thank you all. Thanks for the introduction and thanks for the gracious welcome. I'm going to spend a couple of minutes trying to get used to this microphone because we have a bit of a feedback loop here that's making it hard for you as it is for me, I'm sure, but if I lower it a bit, it might work better. Now, how does that sound? Yeah. It's getting better, isn't it? That's wonderful. I'm, I'm grateful for this because uh, I, although I can from time to time be rather demonstrative and make myself heard, I also have those moments in which I fade into softness, and I don't want to do that unmindfully and leave you wondering whether I'm only doing a pantomime. <laughs> <laughs> For I assure you, uh, this is no pantomime. I'm, I'm here to bring you a serious conversation, though not a detailed reconstruction of my work in this particular area. I, I'm mindful that it really is necessary to be humane. And so I'm not going to mistreat you this evening, but I hope to entreat you to consider very seriously the question I'm going to pose for you, which as you know from the title is the question of conscience. I'm concerned with conscience specifically from the perspective of its relationship to liberty as foundation of liberty and its relationship to standards of civilization, the conduct of decent political life, and in perhaps the that without which Republican institutions cannot be expected to survive. So, so I want to ask you to engage with me in this discussion while I present to you some considered reflections on the broader topic. But I want to start with a question for you, and I'm going to pose that question momentarily. But I want to say, in addition, by way of preface, that I'm going to try to restrict my remarks to a relatively short period of time so that we can have an extended period of time for interaction with questions and pursuing the conversation. Now, whether I succeed in doing that, <laughs> I, I, I make no warranties. <laughs> but I'm going to try. I want you to know I am going to try very seriously. Now my question for you. What do you think conscience is? Uh, anyone may speak. <laughs> what is conscience? It's your inner self that you check what your actions are. The inner self that checks your actions. Anyone else? Uh, it is, you feel it. And yet sometimes it is silence in you. Is a very mm -hmm. mysterious thing because if it were as active and responsible mm -hmm. and reliable as you would like it to be, you would feel it. The answer is you need to feel it, but I feel like it's negligent and off duty. Okay. Fair enough. Not just for me, but 
Yes, go right ahead. Internalization of shared morality. Okay. We, 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 we've certainly got a gatekeeper. We've got a good range of views here, which is really helpful in framing the conversation that we need to have. Because the first observation I have to make to you is it is really quite remarkable that this term has had the life that it has had, that everyone uses it, everyone recognizes it. Everyone attaches some meaning to the word conscience. And yet, it is perhaps one of the most elusive concepts or constructions with regard to human nature that we have. We cannot, in fact, produce a scientific account of conscience. That's where I want to begin. I want you to understand that we cannot produce a scientific account of conscience. We can speak of hearts and brains, and we speak of feelings, passions, emotions, and we can identify those with precise physiological phenomena. We can't do that with conscience. And we rely on conscience, as it turns out, perhaps more than any of those things apart from our recourse to the brain as a seat of reasoning. And so, since we rely on it, we ought to spend some time thinking about what it is. So let me give you a context for that conversation to go a step beyond. Uh, Edmund Gibbon, you, you remember the decline and fall of the Roman Empire, massive work, magisterial work, greatly helpful in thinking through what transpired in the period of the Roman Empire. But perhaps it is not always apparent to at least a quick reading of Gibbon's work that its most significant, or at least one of its most significant characteristics is that it is an anti-Christian treatise. That Gibbon was a deep skeptic and moreover used his account of the fall of the empire to place the blame primarily on the rise of Christianity. Very interesting. Why in this context is it interesting? Because in the course of assigning the blame for the fall of the Roman Empire, Gibbon focuses in the latter volumes on what happens in the era in which the interaction between the church and the state, pope and the emperor, the contest for the struggle for secular power, between them, he points out, of course, the outrages committed by the church. And as the church grew closer to secular authority, it acted the same way some of the worst emperors had acted and created some of the same outrages in the world. And in the face of those outrages, Gibbon could identify from time to time stout-hearted souls who out of conscience resisted the rule of the church. And he used the word precisely, conscience, that they were not cowed by the demands of religious authority or by the demands of secular authority. They stood, as we would say today, on principle. But he said they stood on their conscience. Now that's a paradox. So I'll tell you what the paradox is, and then I'll explain what lies behind my statement of the paradox. The conscience Gibbon relied upon in his anti-Christian treatise is only understandable as a derivative of Christianity. It is a remarkable thing, a remarkable thing, that someone who sets out to undermine the claim of Christianity to moral authority finds his greatest moral claims in something that he derives ultimately from Christianity. Now, 
I point that out not because my talk is about Gibbon. My talk's really about America, about us, who we are, how we understand ourselves, and what is our character. But Gibbon's experience is not unrelated to our own experience. We have lived through a time in which we have seen the meaning of liberty, the meaning of freedom, become quite confused. I usually describe it as, as we have seen freedom being dumbed down, to put it as bluntly as I may, which is to say that we no longer readily understand the term liberty or the term freedom to describe moral potentialities. We understand it instead in very limited terms of asserting, at the best, self-interested claims to degrees of autonomy, degrees of autonomy that reach no further than to uh, operationalize one's desires in a competitive struggle with others. Very limiting conception of freedom, but it seems to be where we've come. Now, there are reasons for this, reasons that are understandable and that we can trace through our political history, certainly in the late 20th century, early 21st century. But let me just speak broadly for a moment so that we see how I'm talking about this. Uh, since we think of constituency preferences or individual preferences when we think of freedom, we should recognize that the freedoms thus targeted seem in the main to identify a right to act with immunity to social constraint as opposed to legal constraint. That's how we tend to frame the conversation. Now to be sure, legal constraints often buttress the social constraints, and when that occurs, the legal constraints may become a barrier to personal choice that illegitimately entrenches social constraint. That may be fairly said in the circumstances in which laws and mores have evolved in recent times with regard to same-sex relationships. The list of personal preferences, <coughs> otherwise constrained by social disapprobation, however, is much broader than what has come to be recognized in the uh, discussion of same-sex relationships. And indeed, it opens up into what we might characterize as identity construction. A uh, consequence of this development is a discourse of freedom increasingly focused upon individual conduct as an exception to social expectation. So that's what I mean when I say a dumbing down. That is such a strange diminution of the concept of freedom, in which it is detached from principles of sociality. Ultimately, freedom means nothing if it doesn't describe in some fundamental way principles of sociality and certainly collective responsibility for our political life. I can refer you to a book called Our Declaration, which provides in recent times an excellent account of how the Declaration of Independence opened the door to the full assumption of collective responsibility for political life for human beings everywhere. I would do that even more enthusiastically, except it would be unseemly since my daughter is the author. <laughs> <laughs> but the point that she makes in the book underscores what I want to say now which is to say that there are problems with pursuing freedom or liberty on the basis of radical individualism, which have to do with eroding or undermining any prospects for social advance or social progress, and particularly when it comes to fostering in human beings their best exertions or what I would call the potential of the best. P part of what the whole drama of liberty is about is fostering the flourishing of human potentiality. 
And so it is an investment in the potential of the best. And, and this investment in the potential of the best has come into conflict in our times. It's a false conflict, it's a false choice, where some people think we have to choose between caring for the least and fostering and encouraging the best. Some think we have to choose between treating people as patients, as I like to put it, or treating them as agents. And we know what patients are, because they visit doctors. <laughs> but in the more broad philosophical sense, the patient is a being that suffers motion, and doesn't cause motion, is moved, <coughs> doesn't move, and certainly is not self-moved, is subject to control by others. And this false choice between seeing people as agents, of, or patients rather, patients of care, as opposed to agents of production, exertion, the potential of the best, is predicated on the underlying confusion about liberty. Now, the reason we have that underlying confusion, and I'm really cutting to the chase here, I'm not going to do the elaborate presentation that's necessary to establish this philosophically, but the reason for that is because of the misunderstood notion of individual autonomy. That notion is a notion which is perfectly consistent with despotic authority over any other individual. Anyone's autonomy is compatible with someone else's submission, which is enough to persuade us that it's an inadequate account of the liberties that are defended at the founding of this society. Now, when I say that, what I want to focus upon for just about a moment is the need for us to understand that when we talk about the potential of the best, we recognize and accept variable levels of performance among human beings across a range of potentialities. And that, I would say, goes without saying. But we don't mean to say that any and every relative difference among human beings is somehow engaged in this concept of the potential of the best as producing differences in intelligence and character. We do say that with respect to the relevant differences, you have to pay attention to intelligence and character. So our political question, our cultural question, our civilizational question is, how does one foster attention to the best without disparaging those who are not in some particular respect the best. Now, how do you do that? Well, what produces a society in which we can be perfectly sanguine that all are going to be treated with humanity, whatever their varying levels of performance? And at the same time, that we're not going to flag in urging all towards the best performance. That's the challenge that we're looking for. That's the question we want to answer. We want to save humanity <laughs> and also produce the best, the most flourishing condition in which humanity can exist. Now, some people think that's an impossibility. You can't do that. You've got to have, make a choice. You've got to go one way or the other. Well, I'm not persuaded of this. And I think that's because uh, we can observe that we attain the maximum degree of social advance overall when we maximize opportunities for the best intelligences and best characters. That gives us the greatest possible social advance. And the, that particular uh, functionality is captured in the mutually exclusive dynamics of de dependence and independence, uh, by which it suffices to say the more dependent people are in any given society, the less agency they are able to exert, and therefore the less productive they will be. That's straightforward. It is not pejorative. It is not cultural. It is not referring to any particular people or background. 
It is simply an index of human conduct. Thus, it requires intelligence and character. And by character, I mean the disposition of social responsibility, by the way. That's what I mean when I say character in this context. It, it requires both intelligence and character to produce social progress. And that is what freedom seeks to engender. Now again, that requires maximizing, not merely optimizing, the number of persons who can act with effective agency and minimizing the number sunk in complete dependence. So now you see the practical ground for this consideration. We actually have a goal we want to arrive at. And so now we can return to the general principle, the problem of conscience, to ask how it relates to that goal. Uh, well, one of the ways it relates to the goal is because we always have to confront the question of what recourse we have, what resource we can call upon, what we can rely upon in order to achieve this maximizing function that I'm describing. That resource, some people think, is natural rights. Read the Declaration of Independence in that light. Thinking of human beings as living in a state of nature until they agree to come into society, we're exercising their natural rights, they agree to defend themselves from one another, i.e., my right ends where your nose begins, my right to swing my arm ends where your nose begins, in a very minimalist formula. And of course, we've for a long time thought that that was accurate. We thought that that's what produced self-government or consent. We reason through the argument of John Locke. We reason through the argument of Thomas Hobbes and others and say, yes, that, that seems to have the right ring to it. It seems that the right of revolution comes and derives from the simple fact that there is no higher authority that can be introduced to determine what anyone can lay claim to, and therefore all are forced to engage in a kind of bargaining even if it's not literal bargaining, to find a point of equilibrium where they can live at peace with one another. That's the rule of Thomas Hobbes. The first law of nature is seek peace, he said. But that law of nature doesn't say you can seek anything beyond that mere equilibrium in which you're able to do whatever suits your fancy short of injuring someone else. So that minimalist construction, as an understanding of the Declaration of Independence, does not introduce any concept of social responsibility. None whatever. Which leads to ask, therefore, is it the fact that the founding of the United States is actually not a very elevated thing at all in human history? That it's really rather base, that it offers no more than the minimal condition of not causing trouble for others as the only guarantee people can have for living a decent political life? If so, it will have cheated us of something important. And it would have been itself a dumbing down of liberty. Except I do not believe that is the correct understanding of the Declaration of Independence. But to get to that correct understanding, it's necessary for us to recover the term conscience. Now, here's how we're going to do that without walking all the way through the elaborate argument. And I'll give you some references and indexes so that you will be able to recover it on your own. But I want to start by acknowledging that the Declaration of Independence includes a very important sentence. The sentence that says, prudence indeed will dictate that governments long established should not be changed for light and transient causes, and accordingly all experience have shown that mankind are more disposed to suffer while evils are sufferable than to right themselves by abolishing the forms to which they are accustomed. So the Declaration acknowledges, yes, we have these rights. Yes, they give us the right of revolution. But we don't just heedlessly indulge the expression of that right 
the exercise of that right, we subject everything to a deliberation, a prudent consideration of what is justifiable in the context. And that means ultimately what is morally justifiable. Now, the Declaration in doing that also gives us in the clause following the clause that I just read, that whole expression of collective responsibility. That is to say, people make governments for themselves. A concept which eludes us in a day and age in which we like sometimes to imagine that governments make peoples for themselves. <laughs> but that's not what the Declaration says. It says people make governments for themselves. So now a question emerges. How do people do this simply operating on the basis of the limited conception that each has a right to occupy some space in the universe short of injuring someone else? How, how do they get to make government? What governs their relationships? What governs their reasoning? They're coming together. Well, the missing part in the Declaration of Independence was pointed out by James Madison in 1784 <clears throat> in the Memorial and Remonstrance. And this was a production Madison produced in Virginia when there was a legislation pending in the Virginia Assembly to impose taxes on citizens to support religion. And the Memorial and Remonstrance was an organized opposition to that legislation, which ultimately succeeded in defeating it and therefore defending religious liberty. But the interesting part of James Madison's defense of religious liberty was not a mere separation of church and state argument, but what lay at the core of his presentation before the public was that each of us has a duty to God before our duty to government. He referred to that as conscience, the liberty of conscience. He says, it is from this that we derive from this liberty of conscience, this is what we derive all our liberties from, i.e., this is what describes for us a restriction not upon ourselves but upon government, that government can go so far and no further. Conscience, in other words, has been evoked by Madison and others in the context of the founding as the actual point of departure for the rights that we defend, for the liberties that we exercise. Now this is really rather extraordinary because you see, James Madison understood that conscience was not necessarily something that resulted in uniform expressions of moral judgment. He, he understood that people's judgments would vary. Their conscientious judgments would vary. And still, he was able to say in 1792 in an essay on property, the first property, see, the essay is about the rights human beings have to property, and the first property, he said, is conscience. Conscience, an odd argument, a very odd argument. How does conscience become a property? Where derives this obligation to God, whether you believe in God or not? Because that's the formulation he's saying, using. He's not saying everyone has to belong to a church. He's not saying everyone has to believe in God. He only says everyone has an obligation that derives from God, which is called conscience, the right of conscience. Most bizarre, most bizarre. In structuring that argument, Madison has entered into a conversation characteristic of much of the 18th century, which has this distinction. So much of what we read in the 18th century, whether in political philosophy, in literature, in uh, religion, or anything else, sounds a little odd to our ears at this point. You know, it's not all vernacular. But here is language that was used throughout the era that is still vernacular to us, the appeal to conscience. We don't have any discomfort in hearing an appeal to conscience. 
we are willing to make the journey all the way from uh, Sir Thomas More to who knows whatever recent martyr, and we still recognize the appeal to conscience. And in the 18th century, they were able to do that. George Washington, as an 11-year-old, wrote out 110 rules of civility and decent behavior in conversation and society. And the last one, the 110th, was labor to keep alive that little celestial spark called conscience. Little celestial spark called conscience. Now, as I said at the outset, this is peculiar because we don't know what conscience is. That is, we don't know by virtue of our own inquiries into the realm of nature. And if we pursue them, we're going to run aground. We'll run into the Stoics, for example. The Stoics who say, yes, there's a natural law. Reason can uncover that law. And once reason does, it is binding. Yes, that is a Stoic argument. That almost sounds like conscience, except for one very important distinction. Very few people, according to the Stoics, could attain that level of understanding. So it was a, the attainment of a few and not the endowment of all that the Stoics were describing. The same was true of Socrates' knowledge is virtue. The attainment of a few, not the endowment of all. But each time we invoke the word conscience, we're speaking about an endowment for everyone. Everyone. So it can't be what these other examples suggest. It is not the brain. It is not the heart. We can't find a physiological home for it, and yet we think it's real. Now, here's the point in the conversation where one might think, all right, now is this Alan about to tell us there's no such thing as conscience? And therefore throw us completely at sea with respect to moral judgment? Is that where he's going? Well, no, I'm not going to go there. There might have been a time in the life of inquiry, my life of inquiry, where I paused and wondered about that. You might find a distant publication of mine someplace in which I played with these ideas in dangerous ways. Yes, you might do that. But I can say now with considerable confidence that I have found a home for this thing called conscience. To make the long story short, it is reflected, of course, practically in Acts 5.29, when the apostle says, we are to obey God rather than men. What? Where did that come from? And the more we dig into those texts, we begin to see the emergence of this term conscience, sunedo in the Greek, which, without elaborating, means basically knowing without effort, <laughs> a kind of passive knowledge. And they were using the term and use it throughout the New Testament. It never appears in the Old Testament, nor anything in relation to it. So this new thing is sprung upon the world, describing a kind of knowing in which we don't make any effort, a passive knowing. Now, of course, it's further elaborated through many of Christ's teachings as well as other observations by the apostles. But I think the best way to understand it is to remember something important. Namely, prior <clears throat> to the revelation of Christ, we can say that mankind and certainly the children of Israel lived in the age of prophecy. And in the age of prophecy, God commanded men through men, i.e., he sent prophets to the children. And the children received what they got by the way of commands from God only through the agency of human communication. And nobody's surprised that that would have variable influence, <laughs> not always be taken with the full weight of authority <laughs> that it ought to have borne. And so, the age of prophecy proved deficient with respect to guiding human conduct. 
which is why the children of Israel so often had to be punished. So the successor to the age of prophecy is the age of conscience. Why? Because Christ himself said, I'm going to leave, but I'm going to leave with you an agency. He called it by many names, an advocate, and Holy Spirit, Holy Ghost, as the translations go, comforter, you name it. But it's, it's, each of you will have it. Each of you will have it. And this thing that the gospel writers call conscience is their understanding of the fulfillment of that promise by Christ. Now, bear with me. I'm describing an historical and cultural phenomenon, but potentially also a reality. Do you understand what I'm saying to you? That we have to take seriously this claim that though we do not necessarily walk in the pathways pointed out by conscience because we retain the ability to deviate from it, we never lack its guidance. That is the claim. That is the relevant claim. We do not lack its guidance. Well, I could say much more about that, but I want to come back now to the founding of the United States. So you know where I'm coming from. This thing called conscience actually exists for the people who are referring to it. It actually describes the relationship of human beings in the world. They actually are able to derive from that political principles. Most importantly, the principle of liberty. You know, render to Caesar what is Caesar's, render to God what is God's. Don't let government get in the way of obeying conscience. That's the derivative rule. On the basis of that, liberty comes to be structured. Now, here's what's interesting. I'm cutting to the chase. Not only does it inspire liberty, but it inspires confidence. Confidence that the consciences that will prevail ultimately and the justification for the confidence I cannot explain to you, but there is this expressed confidence that the consciences that will ultimately prevail will be the consciences that advance social progress. And that's where this, what George Washington called the amelioration of our social conditions comes from. That given free reign, unimpeded conscience will ultimately operate to advance social conditions rather than to retard them. It is a long argument to talk about how that might be realized or how we might have seen it in the course of our history as a nation. But what I want to say is this, and it's a way of sort of shortcutting the whole conversation, that Abraham Lincoln in 1859 said this, this is a world of compensations. And he who would be no slave must consent to have no slave. Those who deny freedom to others deserve it not for themselves. And under a just God cannot long retain it. God's justice, Lincoln suggests, does not displace human responsibility but builds in reciprocating principles that prevent the ultimate overturning of divine commandments. This is interesting because it argues implicitly that humans make judgments, they undertake actions, that interact, interact with God's teachings in such a way as sometimes to contravene, but never to overturn that teaching. So that confidence that I speak of comes from this conviction that however much human beings may depart from the law or rule of conscience, they can never overturn God's commandments. Hence, they will ultimately, in their own sloppy way, meander towards justice. Thus, at the very heart of political foundation lies the question 
of whether the fundamental principle guiding that foundation is or is not a reflection of the direction of conscience rather than reason. See, it's not to say that reason doesn't participate, but it's to say, is the authority the authority of reason or is it the authority of conscience? Well, if the liberty, if the liberty that we praise, that we will celebrate in a few years on the sesquicentennial of the bicentennial, uh, of the uh, sesquicentennial of the Declaration of Independence, pardon me, uh, whether that liberty is to be understood as liberty of conscience more than anything else is what's at stake in this formulation. Because if we only defend it as the liberty of reason, subject as liberty is to extraordinary variability and even to be reduced to nothing more than subjective preferences in some formulations of what the power of reason is, then we will lose all power to give a moral foundation to the society founded by the Declaration of Independence. And that means to lose all power to sustain the argument in favor of civilization, including the argument I presented at the outset, that relationship of the whole notion of the ethics of care and the ethics of production. For what this persisting conscience does is maintain that connection between the two. How important is that? That's the last thing I'm going to say tonight, and then we'll have a conversation about this. The, the importance you will reflect upon in this way. The, the, the comfort of the least is something no conscience can resist. I submit that to you. Now, take the least in the most extreme terms, and therefore the most necessitous, those who by defect of, of ge genetics or accident are rendered utterly helpless and who will not be cared for unless someone provides that care. That's comfort for the least. It doesn't stop there, of course. It continues through the whole range of human capacities and human conditions. I'm submitting that the ethic of care the comfort for the least is irresistible to the human conscience. At the same time, the ethic of production is absolutely necessary to perform the ethics of care. You aren't going to be able to help someone unless you produce the resources with which to do it. They are not in tension with each other. They are, in fact, both aspects of the dictates of conscience. It's a stewardship question, ultimately. If you are moved by the ethics of care, you must be moved to make care possible. The rule of conscience requires it. Not some abstract social and political theory. Conscience. Think about that. Think how that cuts across lines of political division in our society. How we can find new ways to conceptualize what it is we have the opportunity to accomplish acting together. If we only remember the ethic of production without the ethic of care is, as Aristotle tells us in the first book of the politics, useless. You can only acquire so much when acquisition loses its meaning, if it's only acquiring it personally for you. But what gives great acquisition its power is precisely its applicability to caring for others. I'll illustrate this for you, then I'm done. <laughs> My son has just created a foundation. Uh, this foundation is interesting. You know, these business people, they're always making foundations these days, and so he's made his. <laughs> his, his foundation is going to focus on persuading late 40s, 50-ish people who have secured all that it's really possible to secure to maintain their lives, their families, etc., to persuade them 
to retire early and go to work caring for people, rendering service. He's just mounting it right now. It's the perfect example of what I mean by the connection between the ethics of production and the ethics of care. You gotta have a reason for all this productive activity and that reason is care. No one should be embarrassed to show concern for the comfort of the least. And least of all, when they can also show that they'd never lose sight of the importance of encouraging the potential of the best. That is a rule of conscience. That is the principle of civilization. That is the standard of liberty. Well, I said I would try to leave time. I didn't leave as much as I wanted to, but nevertheless, there's some. So let's, let's talk, but I will say this. I want you to indulge me, first of all. It, it is with me a habit that in presentations of this character, undergraduates always have first call on questions. And so I will ask graduate students, faculty, and community members to be patient while I give first any undergraduates in the room the opportunity to ask a question. Yes, go right ahead. <laughs> Mm -hmm. uh, and I was wondering, would you, would you agree then that, um, that, that humanity in general, we are, um, we are social creatures who are self-interested at heart? We are social creatures, self-interested only if you mean by self-interested that we are concerned to move ourselves in the sensible world at our own direction. Now, you didn't expect that answer, did you? <laughs> so let me say a word about that. And this is related to conscience. You see, if this faculty function operates the way I've been describing it, what it means is that man is not simply a stimulus reaction mechanism. That within the empirical world, the sensible world, it is not simply the case of there are external experiences, stimuli, which we internalize and react to, but that we actually move ourselves from within. We initiate our motion. We are, with respect to the sensible world, unmoved movers. Now that particular expression, the unmoved mover, is the formulation Aristotle uses in his description of God in the universe. But there's a way in which then human beings are like God on a small scale. They're not like God on the creating scale, but they're like God in relationship to the world around them. That is, they are moved by it, but they also move in it independently of it. And they can also move it at their own initiative. So when you say self-interest, I ask, well, what do you mean by that? Do you mean that I have sufficient autonomy to set my course, to do what I choose to do? The answer is yes. But if you meant by self-interest something much more limited and utilitarian, as if anyone ever knew perfectly well what was to his own good, and only did what was for his own good, well then I would have to disagree, because even if it were true that human beings acted with reference to a perceived good, I could never say any more than Socrates would have said that they do so infallibly. And if they think something is good for them when it's not, and they pursue it, was it in their interest? Ah, uh, no, I think not. And I think they would agree with me after the fact. So you see, I have to change it into this whole question of whether I act with reference to my intentions. If that's what you mean by self-interested, that I'm an unmoved mover in the sensible world, yes, the answer is yes. But that goes beyond Locke and Hobbes. Any other undergraduates? All right, we throw it open. Anyone? Yes, sir. So at the beginning, you asked us what we thought conscience was. Mm -hmm. And I didn't answer then, but in my head, I'm thinking conscience is my sort 
sort of innate knowledge of what's right and wrong based on what I would consider to be reasonable or objective values. Ten of those are included in the Bible. Mm -hmm. But I don't necessarily think, so I'm confused a little bit because it seemed like you're saying that Christ gave us conscience, mm -hmm. which would mean that before Christ there was no conscience. Right, I, I'm and glad you got that. In the Old Testament could never have acted with conscience. I have, that, I have a hard yeah. time with that. Well, let me explain it to you then. As I say, I'm not going to tell you the whole story, but I'm going to give you at least a glimpse of it. Uh, go back to Genesis and go back to God walking in the garden, calling out, Adam, where are you? What did Adam do? He hid, timidly, we can imagine, peeked up his head uh, here. <laughs> But, but we hid from you because we were naked. Who told you you were naked? <laughs> that question says the capacity for conscience was there, but conscience wasn't there. Nobody told him he was naked. You said it's internal knowledge, but it isn't acquired knowledge. That's the point. Adam had it, but it wasn't operative. That's why in the age of prophecy, conscience was not the rule for consideration. Direct communication was necessary, and the experience was variable. When Christ says, I will give you a sure guide, what he's saying is, I'm performing an operation on conscience. So, yes, this faculty was always there, but it wasn't called conscience because you didn't pay any attention to it, you didn't know you had it, it didn't effectively constitute a rule for you. I'm going to turn it into a rule for you. So in that way, whatever this disposition is in the character of the human being, it comes to be conscious in the active sense. It's as if you have a chemical compound that was inert, and you discover that by adding a slight element to it, it becomes active, an agent. That's what it's about. Except that, sorry. Oh, go right ahead. <laughs> you're using the Bible to justify your biblical theory. No, I'm not using the Bible to justify biblical theory. I'm only recounting what the Bible recounts. Right, but the Bible is a limited body of knowledge. You're not talking about what the people pre-New Testament did. You're talking about that pre-New Testament, it was a, a prof prophetic culture. Yes, it was a prophetic age. It was only prophetic when God attempted to talk to the people. You're not talking about what the people did amongst themselves. They're perfectly good societies that interacted with each other independently of... Absolutely, absolutely. I don't, I, don't, I don't know that I'm disagreeing with anything you're saying in that regard. What I'm saying is no one in that prophetic age acted, acted with recourse to conscience. How do you know that? We have no record of it, we'll put it that way. The record beyond the Bible. But that's your assumption that, that Christ dropped it in because we have a record of that. No, 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 no. It's, it's, let me put it another way to you. What we have is an accounting of how the human experience was understood by those who lived it. And that accounting shows us the progressive development of a concern with moral guidance as it operated in human beings. Now, we remember Naboth, if you want to use Naboth as the example of a conscientious human being, who, when asked to sell his vineyard, responded what? He didn't say, I can't by reason of conscience. He simply said, God forbid. God forbid. So, so he understood the rule in that sense as he had received it prophetically. And we look at such examples and we say, all right, this is how people understood themselves. And then we come to a point where we see a change in the points of reference. And they give a different account of themselves. And they, or you can contrast the martyrdom of, the, of Daniel or, or Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego to the martyrdom in the Roman carnival. <laughs> that they 
both show the stoutness, if that's what you're looking for, the resoluteness, but in one case, they refer to themselves as carrying out specific commands. The other case, it is clearly an expression of piety, understood as called forth through the prophetic tradition. I, I'm not, in other words, saying I have a religious commitment which makes this the appropriate meaning for my religious commitment. What I'm saying to you is this is a reading which is accessible to any understanding of these facts as they are recorded and reported. And as it turns out, interestingly enough, not recorded only in the Bible. Enough of the historical context comes through other sources as well. Now, I would certainly want to encourage you to be skeptical. I think that's a healthy attitude. But I will warrant you should think seriously about where your skepticism will land you. For you must understand that this notion of conscience as an internal reference point is nothing independently of some other account of it than the assertion of subjective preferences. And it becomes nothing more than, I believe it because I believe it. That's not how I described it. I described it as a reference to an objective sense of right and wrong. Uh, the words objective sense of right and wrong are words that can be strung together syntactically, but whether they are references to anything substantial is another question. <laughs> okay. Start here and then we'll come around. Um, I, I just wonder the, the discussion of uh, conscience sort of animating the resolution mm -hmm. to this, whether we're promoting excellence or caring for the least. Um, could you say something about how? So, what do you think that would, should, would, could lead us to in terms of pragmatic action in the world? It would, should and does lead us into continuous deliberations about the appropriateness of public policies. That is the work we carry on consistently and constantly. And that is the ethic that informs that work. It may do so well or ill. We may be aware, we may self-conscious that that's what we're doing, or less so. As I've said, and I didn't go through all of that, but we've come through a period in which we've become confused about what we're trying to do. And so instead of realizing that we were engaged in a public deliberation mutually reinforcing, we think we're engaged in some kind of strange warfare where winner takes all, win or lose is the name of the game. Well, that means we've departed from the founding conception at that point. I, I Follow I'm up. I'm wondering how do you, um, I mean, the, obviously uh, the political free-for-all that goes mm -hmm. on in America um, is a, seems like a product of people's concept of what conscientious behavior is. Yes. Different. Of course, that's what I'm saying, yes. And so, um, how, how do you overcome the fact that, you know, what one, one uh, faction, I mean, you're obviously yeah. um, part of the conservative um, political... I, I, I think, I think and perhaps... So I'm just how, how does that work? Yeah. How do you see that working to make it less partisan or, or something like that? I guess it would have to be if it's going to be effective and that one of the things that's going on is that there's more partisanship and there's conscience at work, it seems like. Uh, well, <laughs> let me say, <laughs> you, you complicated what, your initial question, which was very straightforward, but, <laughs> but let me say this. <laughs> I, uh, I think it's really important to understand that the argument I'm delivering now is not a partisan argument. It is, if anything, an anti-partisan argument. 
in every fiber of its being, and that no one can find comfort in this argument from a partisan perspective. Because what it does is summon forth a commitment to collective responsibility for social advance. It calls forth a revivification of conscience as an appropriate resort for public deliberations, that we can admit them there. But now let me add this, and this goes back to the very first question, or the question on the back. Don't assume, because I have identified the origins of conscience as Christian, that my argument is that it requires a people who are Christians to live according to conscience. That is not the argument. And I was explicit in citing Madison, who made that explicit. So that you, just as Edmund, <laughs> pardon, just as Gibbon, stood on the foundation of Christianity to make an anti-Christian argument, a country in which there's not a single Christian, if it were based on conscience, would be a Christian nation. It is because of that principle itself, not the professions of the individuals, that one has access to this power. That is the argument I'm making. When you use the term God, mm -hmm. You use that in the concept of a theistic being or a power beyond our knowing and understanding and comprehension. <laughs> Why didn't you tell me they were tough? <laughs> <laughs> God is real to me. I have no doubts about that at all. Whatever, whatever. That doesn't answer the question. I, I'm not done with it either. <laughs> <laughs> I, I just want you to know that while we can question these things in any number of ways, we can also experience them with great clarity. And we needn't always find a perfect coordination between the ratiocination, the questioning, and the clarity. You say, is God something beyond comprehension? I say, no. God can be comprehended because God can make itself comprehensible. And moreover, if I speak merely from the perspective of my work in philosophy, and particularly in Aristotle, and Aquinas, I am by reason completely persuaded that it is possible to ascend to the knowledge of God through reason. And I'll remind you what is said in the Summa Contra Gentilis that it is only salvation that cannot be attained through reason, but the knowledge of God can be attained through reason. So I think that there are some comfortable maxims we've become accustomed to about our relationship to God that have misled us. And we really ought to abandon them. It is not true that we cannot know God. We can know God. Yes? I have a, I have a brief question and then a, I think a plaintiff question. Mm -hmm. So the, the brief one is, uh, would you say, or would you agree with me? Probably the better agenda. That God is a pluralistic evangelical? What? Well, <laughs> you, you, you know I'm going to ask you to elaborate. <laughs> no, I guess I'll just Yes. Uh, yeah. and, and, and so I'm grateful for that and, and believe that. Um, and at the same time, uh, God, as, as I understand God in the person of Jesus, uh, remains evangelical. Yes. 
So, um, so I heard you say yes, so I'll move on to my plaintiff question. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, and, and I so appreciate the connection between um, uh, an ethic of production and an ethic of care for the least. Yeah. Uh, my, my plea is, um, I, I, I have none of the confidence that you have that uh, empirically, uh, conscience cannot but help itself from care for the least. Oh. Because I don't, I think there, there seems to be so much evidence by my judgment, which is this frightening part, that uh, the people who, who should have conscience seem to be disconnected from care for the least. Please share with me your confidence that those, uh, two, that those two are in fact connected. Well, I, my confidence derives simply from counting. As I look at the world, I take account of the interactions people have and the things that they do, I find far more pervasive evidence of conscientious care than of neglect or attack. It's, it's that straightforward. I think as we encounter the world, we have to be prepared to be tutored by the world. Mm -hmm. and, and watching it, whether through the course of history or merely contemporaneously, the number of acts of genuine humanity are more apparent to me than the opposite. And I can do that systematically. I'm speaking now loosely, but I, you can count these things. Like empirically, you can go out and ask. Are people typically decent to one another? Well, back they are. <laughs> they really are, typically. Now, do they... Uh, eventuate in the fulsomeness of friendship that ought to characterize the political community? Well, not as much as we would hope to see, but we still have hopes for that eventuality because that's what it's all about, it is flourishing in human community. That's what human development is about. But we see ourselves moving in that pathway over time against all kinds of odds, all kinds of difficulties and impediments. Uh, human beings do not simply obey even what they imagine to be objective right and wrong, <laughs> let alone follow their consciences. That's one of the things I pointed out. It's a variable performance. But I do believe that the tendency overall confirms the authority of conscience. I was going to go here at first, and then I'll come here. Go right ahead. I got, I got a couple of minutes. We'll start with, I'm really struggling with the right conception of conscience as being an innate concept by mechanism in its development. Okay, uh, go ahead. Does yeah. that make sense as a question? Yes, it does. Go right ahead. I'm, I'm, I'm interested. I understand what you're saying, but then also drawing that stark dividing line between, um, let's say, maybe the Bible is the first utterance that we get of this word or concept, but doesn't mean that it didn't exist prior to that. I think that was kind of the question you were getting at. Right. Um, and that people didn't act with it, even though they didn't have a word for it conceptually. So it's, I mean, I guess I would argue that conscience more than being innate is just something that we acquire from our birth as we develop and, and see and interact with the world around us and maybe from our parents. And if I understand your question, you're saying, is not conscience a part of what the world develops in us through its influence upon us? Right, instead of the other way around. <clears throat> but that's what the point is, isn't it? Well, that's the question, yeah. I just, I want you to All right. Uh, th that argument is an empirical, that question is an empirical question. It requires empirical demonstration. And it requires not only empirical demonstration of what the world is actually doing to us and doing consistently to each and every one of us, but also what the consequences are if it's doing that. Now, the first premise is impossible because no two of us has the same empirical experience and cannot. It's impossible. But no two of us has the same conscience either. Uh, no, that doesn't follow. Wait a minute. We haven't made conscience merely empirical yet, so it's not necessarily subject to the limitations of empirical experience. But first, understand that no two beings, not merely human beings, no two beings can have the identical empirical experience. You understand that in the context of space-time and all the other relationships that govern it, right? I was a physicist, so yeah. Okay, that's, I just want to be sure I'm talking to you in the language you understand. Now, if you know that, then you know you can't conclude from mere empirical experience to a common phenomenon for each distinguished being. 
You, in other words, you must situate each in the place that it is with respect to what creates its place. Each has a place, right? So, so to move from that singularity to the commonality that you're describing would suggest that something's happening independent of what assigns to each thing its place. Now, what is that independent thing that's happening then? Well, okay, let's, let's get some help. We, we could probably both use some help. Go ahead. I think it's tribalism. You learn by your influences around you. Now, your experience, from, let's say in this room, mm -hmm. these people are going to help form a moral backbone. You're going to have a slight different perception than I'm going to have. But we're going to have the majority And I think it's the social mores that help form your passions. Go ahead. Well, what we're seeing in the Colorado Supreme Court, they're defined as that just now of character and fitness. And they're limiting, it seems like, to alcohol and drugs. What we're facing that actually our loss of liberty. And so the standard of liberty you define, it, to me, it's ideal, I wish. But it's really frightening what's happening to our liberty and democracy that we deal with every day trying to counteract this absolutely Well, as I said at the outset, we are living through a time in which liberty is being dumbed down. And so I'm not surprised to hear your observation. Uh, I think, however, I want to remind you of one of the conclusions I offered, namely the responsibility for maintaining the vibrancy of liberty falls upon the people. Uh, now, I, I didn't go into this critique of allowing lawyers and judges to define our character. But uh, I could make that critique. <laughs> well, well, well that, that is a much longer uh, development. And I'm not going to pretend to give you a kind of uh, elevator speech about what can be done. But I will say this, the healthy attitude of mother, I'd rather do it myself will go a long way in resetting the balance in this society. And if people would simply take on that affect and be more readily prepared, say, mother, I'd rather do it myself, they'd go a long way toward accomplishing the goal that you aim at. But just to spend a, a second or two on this question of social mores, and I, I, I published a piece a couple of decades ago called The Truth About Citizenship uh, in the Cardoza Law Journal. And in it, I made an argument which was specifically addressed to the question of whether citizenship had any real meaning or not, whether it had any universal content, whether we could speak of citizenship in terms that were transnational, trans-tribal. In the course of the argument, I think I made a pretty convincing case that the whole notion of citizenship properly understood it does nothing more than mark the era in which we evolve beyond tribalism and beyond subjection to recognize the universal claims of humanity as the basis of politics. To say we're tribal is to say we have no foundation for our politics other than our immediate associations. We are, as you said, a product of what is around us. We exercise no choices. The choices we imagine to be exercised are really only reflections of things, influences to which we've been subject. And so we can't take responsibility for them. And a curious consequence of that line of argument is we can neither make anything of ourselves nor take responsibility for anything that we do. Very curious consequence of thinking that way about who we are. I prefer to think of us as agents, not patients. Patients are the people who are shaped by what's around them and have no choice in the matter. 
agents shape what is around them and exercise choice in the matter. Oh, I'm sorry. Did, go ahead. So I am trying to see things from God's point of view, I guess. And I'm thinking that maybe the era of conscience and relying on conscience to, mm -hmm. for God to reach humans isn't working out much better than the era of prophets. And that there might be a kind of moment of assessment where the deity might say, well, I'm the next era here. And I, 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 think, I have no idea myself, I'm not a quantifier, how one would ever get these things calibrated. But you have noted several times the variability in human performance. My, my lame opening response to your what is conscience was about. I don't know, it's there sometimes, and then it's no. deadened and silenced other times, and I'm not totally certain I understand why it comes out strong and then goes away, but it, it seems like that variability has been something you've noted yes. a lot. And mm -hmm. I'm just um, thinking that your son's foundation is its own statement that a lot more has to go into getting that connection between achievement and excellence and productivity and care because your son shouldn't need to create that foundation. If you're like, you and your son are going to have a tough time at holiday Thanksgiving dinners and those things because he, if you were right, then his foundation isn't necessary. No, I, I think that, that I have that done the singular right? misservice. Can I just ask him, you talk I, with him about this? Right? I performed <laughs> the singular misservice of, of misleading you about what I was saying. I was not saying that conscience is self-executing. It's really important. James Madison doesn't say it is self-executing. What he says is it has priority. And so whether it executes itself in accord with the will of God or in contravention of the will of God is a secondary consideration. The primary consideration is the rights of conscience can alone establish political authority in a way that engenders meaningful social progress. That's what the argument is about. Now, having said that, I'm perfectly willing to acknowledge that very ability you describe. Uh, I think it's really important for us to avoid utopian expectations. You can see the need for your son's foundation because of what you refer to as the dumbing it down aspects of understandings of liberty. Yes. And I've been trying to think of what is the opposite of dumbing it down, and it's got to be smarting it up. I don't know what, yeah. what it is there. But you see your son as a force, and he sees himself as a force in reversing that dumbing it down. I would say so, yes. Okay. Yes. Uh, in other words, the opposite of dumbing liberty down is sustaining its open to transcendent experience. That's the opposite of dumbing it down, okay? And, and being moved by trans, transcendent ideals is very important so that the liberty which operates upon that foundation actually has scope to have good influence in the world. That's, that's fairly straightforward. Yeah, well, of course he does. And, uh, no guarantee of success. <laughs> yes, sir. Dr. Allen, I appreciate you coming out here from Colorado. Uh, and your discussions are quite interesting and certainly have called my, uh, caused my consciousness to be questioned. Mm -hmm. But I have some, I'd like you to explain what you, is there any difference between principles and conscious? Because yes. Because a lot of people are using principles as a bludgeon mm -hmm. on the other side. Mm -hmm. And then when I think about neuroscience, you know, you say the sub subtotal of all our human experience decide, helps us to form this conscience. And neuroscience, they come up the subfrontal cortex, and they call it our executive function. Yes. Where we, our total experience mm. is now in the subfrontal cortex, and it's giving us our executive function to help us make decisions which are right or wrong. Mm -hmm. So if someone were raised in a madras and their total experience was there, in the subfrontal cortex or your <clears throat> conscious, they're going to formulate what is right and what's wrong. Are they therefore acting out of consciousness? 
not just to blow themselves up but other people? Are they speaking for their God? Well, I'm going to. How are they making these decisions? I'm going to cheat and invite you to answer that question yourself by referring to the very recent case in California of these children imprisoned, brutalized, whose conditions and circumstances completely defined their environment and everything they could possibly know, and yet one of them escaped and found freedom. I'm going to ask you to explain that. It's the same question. It's the same question you're asking. That's correct. Okay. Well, they're amygdala. Somehow they're amygdala. So, you know, they got enough force. They held on. You know, to grab that moment. And seize it. There's just more to human beings than we can account for with physiology. I don't know why that's hard to understand because we all still say conscience. Go ahead. <laughs> their behavior. I'm a play specialist. Physical education, gymnastics, all the, all the physical arts. Now I'm a yogi. And I watch them play with each other. And I watch some of them be mean. And I watch some of them be nice. Mm -hmm. But I watch most of them be nice. Mm -hmm. And we couldn't define everything. We couldn't put an equal sign on everything or whatever mathematical terms, neurological, physiology terms, which I've studied. But when it comes to the heart, and speaking from here, it was a very clear conversation. It was very easy for me to connect with the children through love. Through love and kindness, and, and my ability to, which I wanted to say before, was to share, and to just share. And through that interaction, I. I do believe there is an innate consciousness. It's just there. It's within all of us. Whether we make bad decisions or not, it's still there. And only those that have been severely brainwashed by very, very evil or subversive techniques are without that thing. Now, maybe there are anomalies in science and people that they're born, they're born killers, right? But those are anomalies. Those are, those are the, the variation on the main theme which is love, which is togetherness, which is coordination, and being, using that as the tool. And that can only happen through a conscious feeling that you're doing something good for yourself and for your neighbor. I don't have to mathematically do, you know, when my neighbor gave me something, I didn't have to give them back exactly what they gave me. They could have given me a whole bunch of stuff, and I could have showed up the next day with a drawing. And a, and, a, and, a, and, a, and a bunch of tears in my eyes saying, I love you, man. I really needed that. You don't even know how much that meant to me. I wish I could pay you back, but I don't have any money anymore. And he hugged me, and we hugged, and we loved each other, and said, brother, come by any time. I'll help you when you need help. I said, thank you. I'll, I'll work for you. I'll do whatever I can do for you. You see, there was no math there. I didn't need tit for tat or this for that or nothing. I didn't even need this very, very intellectual discussion by this super intellectual man to tell me that I have a conscience. <laughs> <laughs> well, I want to tell you that. I, I, I want to remind you that the first thing I said was I'm going to tell you something that you already know. <laughs> and so you have given eloquent uh, testimony to that. And I, I want to reinforce the impression that you've granted us that we oughtn't to be timid about acting upon our sensibilities. Of course we should act with sociality, or as George Washington said, we should follow rules of civility, decent behavior. That, that goes without saying, but, but we shouldn't be timid about sociality, because after all, that is what profoundly defines what we are, who we are. 
Now, I also want to correct you on something. And this is not a serious correction, it's more teasing you, but you said you were out, propped out. <laughs> but no one who will address a group like this in the way you did has dropped out. The power of conversation is so vital and so important. And each time we engage it, we recommit to one another. That's what it's all about. Thank you so much.